Everyone, we're just letting some people get in. We have a lot of people waiting to get into the room. If you'd like to, in the chat, let us know where everybody's coming from. It's always great to see where, who we're speaking to on these videos. What would you like us to do, say our, our name and where we are? You have to put your microphone on mute, but you can talk on the chat. We just want to find out where everybody's from while we're letting everybody into the room. And All over. Give it 30 seconds and we'll start 2.39. I love seeing where everyone is from yeah. all over. I'm from Indiana. I saw some Indiana, but my in-laws are in Michigan and I saw Michigan, Royal Oak. They're not too far from there. I haven't seen Georgia yet, but maybe I just missed it. That's <laughs> where I live now. See Canada, Montreal. Yeah, Canada. Oh, I've Ottawa. been to Quebec and oh, I've been to Ontario. It's great when we're, people are representing from yeah. all sides of the border here. Great. Yeah. All right. All right, I think we're gonna start. Sounds good, Manny? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's class, the Windsor Newton Watercolors Mother's Day Card Project. My name is Tim DePack, and I am from Windsor Newton, and I'll be your moderator. I'm being joined by Mandy Peltier, who will be our artist instructor for this class. Mandy will be taking you through today's class by providing information about the products being used showing you some of her favorite watercolor painting techniques and creating these wonderful Mother's Day cards using the Windsor & Newton Cotman watercolor paint by using the Sketcher Pocket Box set. <laughs> uh, before we begin, for those of you who'd like to have a printout for the sketches for the cards, they can be found on the link that will be put in the chat on the side over here, okay? And I would like everyone to know that the class is being recorded and will be available 24 hours once the class is ended. It can be found on michaels.com or Michael's YouTube channel. And also, we will also put the link on the chat on the side for you as well. With that being said, you may choose to follow along and paint with Mandy or sit back and relax and watch Mandy create these great Mother's Day cards and then follow along and create with her while watching the replay. With all that said, Mandy, take it over. <laughs> all right, thanks, Tim. Hey, everyone, I'm Mandy Peltier, and I'm really excited to be back with another class for everyone. I think it's kind of funny because my last class, which was uh, Eastern Bluebird, I think was my hardest class to date in terms of skill level. And I think today's class is probably the easiest or most beginner friendly in terms of skill level. So I kind of designed this class to also teach you more about color theory and color mixing. So we're gonna be mixing a lot of colors today. It's gonna to be basically the basic color wheel minus one color. So because we only have an hour, I'm gonna go ahead and share my overhead camera and we will get started. And I love the look on my face when the camera freezes <laughs> from one camera to the next. It's always, it cracks me up. Okay, so here's the overhead view. I always like to start my classes just quickly going over the supplies. These are the two cards we're going to learn. One has tulips, one has butterflies. These could make great Mother's Day cards, but you could use them as just a general greeting card or even as wall art. We'll be making them on two five by seven sheets of paper. As part of the downloads for the class, there was one sheet of paper that says, please print before class. We're gonna basically make a butterfly as if we were making a, a snowflake where you fold the paper in half and you cut along the fold. So if you've already transferred your line drawings through tracing or just prior to class, then you don't need to use this. This is just for those of you who wanna draw along with me during the class. And then it is important today that you have an artist palette that has individual wells because we will be mixing 11 colors. So we'll be using all 10 on a 10 well palette plus your center well. Mine happens to have two in the middle, but most that I've seen just have the one. So we'll be using every single well that there is on the palette. And then like Tim said, we'll be using the Skechers pocket box set again. You will need a graphite pencil and an eraser for when we sketch the outlines. 
and a number 10 round brush, a number four round brush, and I will be using a gold metallic marker. This is just the Michaels Recollections brand. And then I also have a heat gun today. I only need the heat gun for this butterfly card where butterflies overlap just to sort of speed along the drying process since we only have an hour together. I'm just gonna use them on the parts of the butterfly that overlap and I'll explain why when we get there. And then a glass filled with water. I always have a paper towel or a cloth handy when I'm using watercolor and then a pair of scissors. And yes, these are sewing scissors. So for those of you who are freaking out because you're not supposed to use sewing scissors on paper, these were compromised long ago and I could not find another pair of scissors. I kind of feel like scissors are like pacifiers. You can have 50 pairs and not be able to find one when you need it. So <laughs> I'm using a compromised pair of sewing scissors today. So uh, don't, don't fret, I don't use them on fabric anymore. <laughs> All right, so with that said, we're gonna start by uh, transferring over the line drawings. So I'm gonna set everything aside except for this piece of paper that says please print before class and my five by seven sheets of cold press watercolor paper my graphite pencil and my eraser and we'll go ahead and start with the butterfly and so how we're going to start with the butterfly is I'm going to fold it along this dash or dotted line and I'm going to fold it so that the butterfly is facing up so it's just like if you were making uh, a snowflake we're just going to cut out half of the butterfly along the fold. And then when we unfold it, we'll have a perfectly symmetrical butterfly that we can use as a stencil to actually uh, draw on the butterfly. So sewing scissors are really not the best. They're kind of heavy, but I'm gonna just roll with it. All right, so everyone just go ahead and cut out your butterfly stencil if you haven't already pre-transferred your outlines today. You can also use your window as if it were a light box, or you can use an actual light box if you happen to have one. Light boxes are really not too expensive and they really are a good tool to have in your artist arsenal. Uh, they sure speed things along and they can kind of give you a neat looking outline on your finished or working artist paper but freehanding it is just fine. I usually freehand all of my sketches and then I'll use a light box to transfer that freehand sketch onto my actual working paper so that there's not smears and graphite lines everywhere and erase marks. All right, so I just unfolded my butterfly. So we now have a perfectly symmetrical butterfly that we can just use as a little stencil to help us draw our butterflies. And I'm gonna also pull over the actual outline that was provided as part of the downloads for the class. Because I think it's easier to tell where you need to place the butterflies looking at this than it is the finished piece of artwork, but you can look at whichever one you want. And I'm gonna start with this very upper right corner one. And I'm just gonna place my stencil approximately where I see it on the outline. Uh, it's okay if it's not exact. I'm just kind of placing it. And with my non-dominant hand, I so happen to be right-handed. I'm gonna hold down the stencil and then I'm gonna use my dominant hand to trace around it. And then just be careful as you work around so you don't uh, shift that outline as you trace it. Mandy, can you hold that? Can you hold the, the sketch up so people can see that and just see the details? That this? one and, and the one that you provided, that one there too, just so people uh -huh. have an idea. Yeah, so you can and see. Sure, and I'm gonna explain what all these letters are and these numbers are. They're not important for now. For now, we just are working on getting the butterflies placed approximately where they are on the outline. Thank you. And so now I'm going to do this butterfly here. So I'm going to sort of just angle it however I see it on my outline. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm just trying to get it as best as I can right now. If you want yours to look exactly like this, then I would trace it uh, maybe when this class is over and when it's uh, uploaded to the Michael store website and YouTube channel and you can rewatch and pause as needed. That's the real benefit of this class is um, you can always retake it and pause when you rewatch it. All right, so there's that one. And now I'll go ahead and do this one here. And this one does overlap the one we just drew just a little bit on the lower left wing. So I am gonna overlap it a little and try to get it so that it lines up as far as placement goes. 
and then trace again. So you could freehand these butterflies. Um, it just may be hard to get them all the perfectly the same size and perfectly symmetrical. So that's why making a stencil with a piece of paper is really helpful. Um, you could even make your own butterfly design, just fold a piece of paper in half and use the, the fold of the paper to sort of draw half of a butterfly and then cut it out and see what you created. And you could use that as a stencil. You don't necessarily have to use the design that I came up with. All right, so there's that one. And now I'll go ahead and do this one. I won't forget about this guy, but I like to kind of just work down and then fill in the rest. So I'm gonna do this one. And this also overlaps the one we just drew on. So I'm going to overlap the upper left wing over the lower right wing of the previous butterfly we drew and then hold it down with my non-dominant hand and once again, trace around it. If you have cardstock at home, it might be nice to cut this butterfly out on cardstock. It might give you a little bit more stability to trace around, but I'm just using regular printer paper and just being careful as I work around the little stencil. The cardstock would be good if you want to create multiples as well. So if you're only cutting it out once, a couple more cards if you want to make for the kids and stuff like that. It's always helpful. Yes, absolutely. All right, so now up here, this one that's sort of on its own, looks like he's flying away from the group here. <laughs> I'm gonna trace this one on now and then we'll tackle the ones that are in the lower left. All right, and this also speeds along the drying process, I think having a little stencil to cut out. I have a, a class coming up uh, where I can show you real quick. It's going to be on Friday, May 21st. It's this Be Kind wreath. And uh, there's also going to be one of these folded stencils for the bee to help the bee be symmetrical. And that was no pun intended to help the bee be, get it? And <laughs> that way we can draw that on pretty quickly as well. And it can be symmetrical just like the butterfly. So I hope you guys will show, show up for that one. That is Friday. It's uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, whereas this one is 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it's an hour early, earlier than this one. And it's on a Friday instead of a Tuesday. I just dropped it in the link on the, in the chat for those people who would like to sign up and take a look at it. It's there Perfect. for you. With the link. All right. And then I'm going to tackle this one in the very bottom lower left. And then I'll draw on the one that sort of overlaps it. So I'm just sort of tilting it until it kind of looks like what it does on the outline. Okay, and then last but not least, this one here. So this one overlaps the bottom left one, but it does not touch this middle one. So I'm gonna sort of place it and arrange it so that it overlaps the one, but not the other as best I can. It's not a huge deal if it overlaps both, but these butterflies are all numbered in a certain way because we are going to use a wet on wet technique. Like each individual butterfly receives a wet on wet technique, which means you're um, adding wet paint into wet paint. But then the butterflies that overlap each other will receive a wet over dry technique. So uh, when the bottom butterfly has dried when the paint has dried, then we'll add the butterfly that overlaps it. And so it'll be wet over dry. And we'll talk more about that as we go. And then the last thing we want to do for this card is the mom lettering. You don't have to use my example. You can just write mom in your own handwriting. But uh, my uppercase M sort of just looks like two arches. So I'm just going to sort of follow what I have here and draw it on. And then there's sort of a sort of fancy looking cursive O and then another sort of lowercase m with arches. So I just sort of squeezed it in along the bottom there. And then that's it for the mom card. And then next will be the happy Mother's Day card. So I'm going to just put this aside for a second, bring over my other five by seven sheet of paper, the outline for the tulips, and I'll have these all side by side, just like I did for my butterfly. And for this one, I'm gonna start with the lettering because it's at the very top. And then that will help me know what I have to work with as far as the tulips go beneath the lettering. Sometimes when I do the lettering for the Happy Mother's Day, I'll start with the T and the H because they're right in the middle. So I might start with the H and then do what's to the right of that and then do what's to the left. But I'm just gonna go ahead and start on the far left with the H 
and just sort of eyeball things. It does help if you print out the outline at the very least, if you're drawing along with me, because then you can kind of have things side by side. And then I think it makes it a little bit easier to gauge size, spacing, et cetera. And um, this is my own handwriting. <laughs> you don't have to use my handwriting. You can just use your own as you do Happy Mother's Day. Um, I mean, I guess it's somewhat fancy, but you can just do your own thing if you want. Uh, it doesn't even have to say Happy Mother's Day. You could do your own wording if you want. Happy Mom's Day or Mommy or whatever you want to do is fine. Or if it's for a friend, you can just say for you or thinking of you or whatever you want to do. Mandy, as you're doing that, just going to remind everyone that the class is being recorded and will be available for replay 24 hours after the class has ended. And I'm going to drop the links in the chat right now for those people who want to save it and uh, go back to it later. Michaels.com or YouTube. All right. And then for the tulips, really, we're just drawing use like the letter U that's all we're doing. And then each one is going to receive a stem. So I'm going to start with the use. I'm going to start with this one that's in the upper middle and I'm just going to draw a U that's about the same size. And then at about two o'clock, if we are pretending this was a clock, maybe it's one I'm going to draw another U that's at a slight tilt. And then there's one that's sort of centered and beneath those two U's. And then I have sort of a droopy tulip. I think tulips are really pretty at every stage, even when they're wide open and start to droop over. Um, and then I'm gonna do these two over here on the left. So this one is what, maybe 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And then there's one here. And then I'm gonna give each one a stem and I'm not even gonna worry about the outline. I'm just gonna literally give each one a stem. And if the stems overlap, they overlap. And I'm just going to pull it down and draw some stems here. And then I'm going to draw three leaves. So a leaf, I'm just going to draw sort of a curved line up and then point it and then do a, a curved line down that sort of mirrors the first one. And then I'll draw one on this one. And I'll draw one on this one. You can do as many as you want. But if you were to count how many tulips and leaves there are, there would be nine total. And I like the rule of odds where there's odd numbers of things. I think it just brings balance and order. Um, so while there's an even number of tulips with um, the leaves, it makes it an odd number overall. And then that's our tulip outline. All right, so I'm gonna set this aside for a second because I mentioned I kind of designed this class so that it could kind of teach more about color theory and color mixing. So I'm going to bring over this color wheel I've been using for my last few classes and I've gotten some good feedback on it. So I think this will be, probably be the most intensive, but I also don't want to spend too much time doing it. But the good news is these two designs are really fast to do. They don't take long at all to paint. Um, but uh, at, you learned in primary school or in high school or, you know, whenever the three primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. So I'm just going to circle those red, yellow, and blue. And whenever you mix two primary colors together, it creates a secondary color. And so red and yellow mixed together create the secondary of orange. Yellow and blue mixed together create the secondary of green. And blue and red mixed together create the secondary of violet. Now, some people get stuck when I ask, what is a tertiary color? Well, a tertiary color is when you mix one primary and one secondary color together. So mixing red and orange together give you the secondary of red orange. Orange and yellow together, or sorry, give you the tertiary of yellow orange. The primary of yellow and the secondary of green give you the tertiary of yellow green. Then we also have blue green, blue violet, red violet. So kind of what I wanna talk about today is everything that falls in between on the color wheel, that falls in between red, and yellow is mixed by using red and yellow together in some sort of ratio. So ideally in nature, if you were to mix red and yellow together in equal amounts, it would give you the secondary of orange. All right, so everything in this wedge. And if you were to mix the primary of red and the secondary of orange together in equal amounts, it would give you red orange but you could also mix red orange by mixing a lot of red and just a little bit of yellow. Because if you look on the color wheel, red is closer to the primary of red. Red orange is closer to the primary of red. 
So it'd be more red and less yellow, or you could just do the shortcut of mixing red and orange together. And with yellow orange, it would be a lot more yellow because it's closer to yellow than it would be red. So it'd be a little bit of red and a lot of yellow to give us yellow orange. Or you could just mix the secondary of orange with the primary of red approximately in equal amounts. And so that's true over here as well. So everything that falls in between yellow and blue on the color wheel is mixed together by using blue and yellow in varying amounts. So yellow green is gonna be either you can mix green and yellow together pretty much in equal amounts, or you can use a lot of yellow because it's closer to yellow on the color wheel and just a little bit of blue to also achieve yellow green. And then blue green would be the opposite. It would be more blue than yellow because it's closer to blue on the color wheel, or you could just mix blue and green together. And then I won't go over this last one because it's the same exact thing, but everything between blue and red on the color wheel. So blue, violet, violet, red, violet is mixed together by using red and blue in varying amounts. So we're gonna get some practice today. Um, because the Skechers pocket box set does have some secondary colors, like it has an orange and it has a green, uh, we'll mix some of our tertiary colors by just mixing a primary with a secondary. But when we get over here, and we mix red violet. Red violet, as you know, I mentioned with these others, it can be mixed by using the secondary of violet and the primary of red, or you can just use a lot of red because it's closer to red on the color wheel and just a little bit of blue. Well, there's no violet in the Skechers pocket box set. So uh, we are gonna mix red violet by using the two primaries, a lot of red and just a little bit of blue versus using violet and red. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So um, we'll do both. We'll mix red orange by using red and orange together. We'll mix yellow green by mixing yellow and green together. But you will get practice on this side of the color wheel mixing two primaries together in varying amounts. All right, so with that in mind, I am going to quickly erase what I did here in case I wanna revisit the color wheel again, it won't distract us. And I'm gonna pull down my artist palette that has the individual wells in it. Mandy, great explanation on all those colors because I think it's very helpful for those that are using the, the pocket set. Uh, you can see by the mixing that you're gonna be doing how you can expand from the 12 colors that come in the set and your, your spectrum and your colors are, are pretty much endless by, by learning the information that you're giving and how to mix. Thank you, Tim. And I, I, as I practice this class, I mentioned this too, and maybe I'll just say it real quick. Um, so I, I talked about if you mix two primary colors together, it gives you a secondary color, right? But you can mix all three primary colors together, red, yellow, blue, and they'll give you both brown and black, depending on how you mix them. I find blacks usually use, need a bit more blue in them, and I find browns usually have a bit more orange and red in them. So the three primary colors are really all you need. And then I guess one other thing I'll say is we've just been talking about this outer ring here. This outer ring here is really just the pure hue of a color. It's what you think of when you think of red or when you think of blue or when you think of green. This uh, next ring here is when you add white to a color. And then this ring here is when you add gray to a color. So it slightly darkens it. And then this ring here is when you add black to a color. So it's a shade, a tint, and a tone. Uh, so this is just, I, I love this color wheel because it also has the shade, tints, and tones, what happens to the pure hue when you add gray or white or black to it. Uh, so we're not gonna be dealing with these three rings today. We're only gonna be mixing the pure hue of colors. Um, but really all you need as far as the palette goes is your three primaries and black and white, and you can pretty much have an endless palette. So um, especially ideally when you're <laughs> dealing with colors found in nature, I know sometimes you're dealing with man-made pigments, it may help to have a couple shades of blue or a couple shades of green like we do in the Skechers pocket box set. But, you know, hypothetically speaking, you really only need the three primaries and then white and black. All right. So with that in mind, I'll keep putting this aside, but I want to keep it here. All right. So with your number four brush, let's go ahead and stick it in our water for a second and give it a stir. And we're going to help those bristles absorb the water. And if you've taken my previous classes, I like to use my brush like it were as if it were a spoon. And I promise I don't use my watercolor brushes like spoons in real life <laughs> but we're going to use it like a spoon and we're going to place three scoops of water into every single well on our palette so 11 different wells uh, so i'll show you what i mean it's quick it, you don't have to take your time with this it's going to be one two three one two three and you're going to work your way around and you're going to put three drops of water 
into every well on your palette. And this is clean water because we haven't mixed any colors yet. So it's allowing every single well or every single color we mix to start off pure and clean. And because we're dealing with uh, dry pans, it'll also allow us to um, work with the paint a little bit and to activate that paint and give us something to work it into. Um, so three scoops of water into each well of your palette. And you can always adjust, you can always add more water if you need to, uh, if maybe the paint is too thick. We want pretty equal paint to water ratio today. Uh, so about a 50% opacity. And we're just gonna start with red because that's at the very top of the color wheel. The good news is there is a red in our set and so we don't have to mix colors. We'll just use the red purely. This is a alizarin crimson. It's the top row, third from the right. And we're gonna do three passes of red into the first well of your palette. If you haven't taken one of my classes before, a pass is taking your wet brush and you're really running it into that paint a handful of times. And then you're going to mix it into those water drops. You're going to wipe it along the edge of your palette and that's one pass. So I'm going to do two more to make three passes and I'm not being dainty with my pressure. I'm really pushing that brush into the, the paint color to pick up that pigment and to deposit it into the well of my palette. All right, and I can tell mine needs just a little bit more water. So we want a fair amount of paint today to work with since we're gonna be making two cards, but it is likely that at some point you may need to mix more of a certain color. So that's red. So for red orange, again, we could mix it by using a lot of red and a little bit of yellow, but because there is an orange in the set, we'll just use red and orange. So I'm going to do two passes of red into the next well of my palette two passes of red, and then I'll quickly just rinse it, wipe it on the edge of the palette, and then I'll do two passes of the cadmium red pale hue, which just to me looks like orange. It maybe has a little bit more red in it than a true orange, but you can see by mixing the red and orange together, it does give us a really pretty red orange shade. And I'll quickly rinse my brush. The next well of the palette would be just orange. So we're gonna mix two passes of the cadmium red pale hue, two passes. And then because this orange in our set is a little bit on the red side, I like to add just a little bit of yellow to it to just tone down the red or to neutralize the red. So I'm gonna quickly just swish my brush in the water and I'm just gonna do one good pass of this lemon yellow color. And that will tone down the red just a little bit and neutralize that extra bit of red that's in this cadmium red pale hue. Man, they have a question from the yes. chat. Someone's having a problem where they're saying that the paint isn't transferring into the well as smoothly as yours. It's just kind of staying on the brush. Is there anything that they could do to get the paint? Is the, is the brush you think maybe just too dry or? I, that would be my first impulse would be that the brush needs to be more wet. Uh, maybe you need a couple more drops of water into your well to help uh, that paint transferred to the well. Um, it may be too that you really need to press harder into the cake to pick up that paint to transfer it to the well. So I would try those three things. Um, I'm using a Cotman watercolor brush and it's working great for that purpose. So um, I don't know what brush you're using. It could have something to do with that. Um, but yeah, just keep playing around with it and trying it. And if you can't get it today, um, please just rewatch this class and pause as needed um, if, you, if you're having a hard time keeping up because of technical issues, if you will. <laughs> so I'm sorry that's happening to you. All right, so next is a uh, yellow orange. So we're gonna mix yellow orange by mixing cadmium red pale hue and this cadmium yellow color together. So I'm gonna start by just doing a good solid pass of the cadmium red pale hue into the next well of my palette. And then I'm gonna do two passes of the cadmium yellow. Yellow is a really light value. Um, it takes a lot of yellow to influence another color. So that's why we're doing two passes of the yellow. And even I'm looking at this and I'm thinking it can maybe use even another pass of it to really help it give that yellow orange color. Um, so you'll just kind of have to play around because you definitely want there to be a, a difference in color where we go from red to red orange to orange to um, yellow orange. All right, and then the next well of our palette is just yellow. The good news is we have just yellow in our set because it's a primary color. So we'll do three passes of the cadmium yellow into the next well of our palette. And that one should already be nice and wet. Update. Just gonna give you an update. It's 
uh, 30 minutes into the project, uh, just to give you a friendly reminder. Perfect. So 30. Yep. And just to let everybody know, as Mandy's going a little quick on this, so if you have to come back and watch the replay within 24 hours, it will be available on the michaels.com website, as well as the Michaels YouTube channel for replay. Okay, next color is yellow green. Yellow green, we're going to mix one pass of Viridian green, which is bottom row far left, and two passes of the cadmium yellow. Um, and then you may have to make adjustments if it's not yellow green enough, but hopefully it will be. So I just did two passes of cad yellow and I'm doing a pass of Viridian green. Ooh, look at that pretty yellow green color. It looks like an apple green. I love it. All right, and then the next Wellover palette will be Viridian Green. We'll do three passes of that. Now, Viridian Green to me is sort of like an emerald green. Uh, it has a little bit of blue in it. It's more blue. So just like I did with the orange, in order to kind of neutralize that blue a little bit, I'm going to do like a half a pass of the cadmium yellow and add it just to sort of soften that green a little bit and make it look a bit more like what we think of when we think of green. So that was three passes of Rudy and green. And then I just added a touch of the cadmium yellow just to tone it down a bit. All right, because we know green is made by mixing yellow and blue. So because the green we have in the set is a little bit more towards the blue side, we can make it more like a true green by just adding a touch more yellow. So that's my color theory there, what my thought process is on that. Blue green, also known as turquoise, one of my favorite, favorite colors is mixed by using blue and green. So we'll be using ultramarine blue, which is top row, second from the right. And I'm going to do two passes of the ultramarine blue. And then I'm going to do two passes of the Viridian green. And then I can make adjustments if needed from there. But usually two and two gives me a really pretty color. Oh, I think I actually want to add a little bit more ultra, ultramarine blue. All right. Ooh, I love that color. All right. So that's turquoise. That was just Viridian green and ultramarine blue. And the next is blue. Blue, we're just gonna use ultramarine blue. Let's do three passes of that color. All right, so that's a quick one because we don't have to use two colors. We're actually gonna skip blue violet. This is the color on the color wheel we are skipping. And that's really just because we don't have enough wells on our palette. So we're gonna skip blue violet and do violet. And violet is gonna be equal amounts of ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson. So I'm going to do two passes of each and then I'll kind of gauge from there if I need to make adjustments. But both should make a really pretty color. Yeah, that's a really pretty purple. I'll put it on my piece of paper. I just love that color. And then last but not least is red violet or sometimes I'll call it mulberry if you took my Valentine's Day class. So for mulberry, I'm going to mix three passes of alizarin crimson because red violet's closer to red on the color wheel than it is to blue. So three passes of the alizarin crimson and then just one pass of the blue. So remember it's gonna be more red than it is blue because it's closer to red on the color wheel. And then even though these two were made using the same two colors, because we used them in different amounts, we got totally different hues. All right. All right. So what a pretty palette. Isn't that such a pretty palette? I just love it. It looks so happy and cheerful and colorful. All right. So those are our colors. And now we are ready to get started on our cards. I think we'll start with the butterfly card. And I think we'll start with the lettering. So grab your gold metallic marker. And again, I'm using just the Recollections brand, the gold colored marker. And I'm going to start by just going over all the lettering one time with my marker. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to thicken up all of my down strokes. And my down strokes are the strokes where my pencil or, or marker is going in a downward motion. So for the M, it would be the right side of that first arch of my M, and then also the right side of the second arch. Because when I drew on the mom, I went up and then down. So I'm thickening up the down stroke. And then I went up and then I went down and I'm thickening up the down stroke by just adding a second line. And then for the O, I'm going to thicken up the left of the O. I'm going to thicken up the left side of that little loop-de-loop. -loop. 
And uh, then for my lowercase m, I'm just going to thicken up all three legs. I'll call them legs of my lowercase m because my marker went down for each of those legs. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. But that's sort of a lettering tip is you can make your lettering look a little fancy if you thicken up all of your downstrokes. And we'll do the same thing for this Happy Mother's Day card as well. All right. So I'm going to pull back over my outline here. So what are all these numbers and letters for? Well, I have a little key where it tells you what each letter means. It just tells you where you're going to be placing the color. So we're working up in a gradient. Uh, if you, so we're starting with the blues and greens and then going to the green yellows and the yellows and the oranges and then the red oranges and the reds and the red violets and the violets. So we're just kind of moving up in a gradient as if we were taking a trip around the color wheel. And uh, each butterfly is going to receive two to three colors that are all right next to each other on the butterfly. And the butterflies that are numbered one are the butterflies we're going to paint on first. And then the ones that are number two are the ones we're going to paint on after butterfly number one has dried. Uh, because we don't want to paint on butterfly two while butterfly one is still wet or the colors will bleed into each other and it will look like one connected butterfly versus two distinct butterflies. Also, when you're layering wet over dry with watercolor, you'll want the bottom color to be a lighter color than the color you layer on top. And that will help the top layer look distinct from the bottom layer. So for this one, for instance, if this butterfly here uh, had been dark red and then we tried to put maybe orange on top, uh, we would activate that darker color on the bottom and then it would kind of make the top layer look funky or kind of make it look like as if we had done wet onto wet. So you always want to layer lighter color to darker color, or at least with this particular project. I'm not saying you always have to do that, but in general, that's how you're going to layer watercolors. So um, we're going to, at this point, use the number 10 brush for both cards. Uh, you'll only need the number four again if um, you need to mix more, your, more paint in your palette. So go ahead and put your number 10 brush in the water. Give it a stir. And as we paint these butterflies, we're also going to paint them on from lightest color to darkest color on each butterfly. So for instance, this butterfly here, this has a number one in it. So we'll start here. Y is for yellow, YG is for yellow green, G is for green. So Y is the lightest value on this butterfly. And then it's yellow green and then it's green. So we're gonna start with yellow, then do yellow green and then do green. And this is going to be wet onto wet. So what we're going to start with is we're going to put our number 10 brush in our yellow paint. We're going to put just a little bit on our brush and then I'm going to wipe it on the edge of my palette. And I'm going to paint on the whole upper right portion of this butterfly wing. And I'm just going to be careful to try and stay in those lines. And it's just that upper right wing. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You could put a little bit on his little head here, but just approximately the upper right part of the wing. And then I'm going to quickly swish my brush, dab it on a paper towel. I'm going to put some yellow green on my brush and I'm going to start applying where this yellow is still wet. Uh, and I'm going to apply the yellow green right where they meet. And then to the lower right part of this butterfly. And where these two colors meet, I'm not going to fuss with it. I'm going to let them organically uh, blend into each other. Now, I didn't have very much paint on my brush, so they're just gently merging into each other. If you have a lot of paint on your brush, you'll get more of a bloom effect, like what you see here on this example. Do you see how you get some of those like tie dye looking veins and swirls? Well, I'll try to show you with the screen. Watch it not work for me since I'm trying to show you. But if you put a lot of green on your brush, and then you put it right into the, uh, the colors that meet, you'll get more of a bloom effect or some more spider veins. Maybe so, a question, when you're done yes. with this, will you be erasing the pencil marks off of that? Yes, when you are totally done, you can erase the pencil marks. Generally speaking, I like to use um, a really hard graphite pencil, like a 4H to a 6H, because the graphite color is so light that you can't even really see it. Um, I understand for this class, you can see what I'm doing. I used a darker graphite color, but in generally, in general, I use a really light color so that you can't even really see it beneath the watercolor. Yeah, so I was going to say for, for the people watching at home, 
Mandy tends to do that much darker because you can see the angle of the camera that you want to be able to see where she's putting those sketches at. So if you're at home, you would be using a much lighter sketch on those as well. So she's doing it just for video purposes. You can see it. Yeah, exactly. All right. So that's butterfly number one. And now let's go ahead and do this one up here. So we're kind of working from left to right. If you happen to be left-handed, feel free to just follow along with the guide and work left to, or from right to left. Um, but we're going to do this one up here. Orange is the lightest color on this butterfly. So I'm going to put some orange on my brush and I'm going to apply it to the entire left half of this butterfly. And we're using a number 10 because it holds a lot of paint and it's bigger. So it allows us to paint uh, a little bit faster and get coverage a little bit faster because this is a project where you do want to move quick so we can do wet into wet. Uh, and then after you have the orange on there, just swish your brush, dab it on your paper towel, pick up some red and paint on the lower uh, right half of the butterfly and just meet that color right up where the orange ends, at least on the lower right half of the butterfly. And then after you have the red on, do the same thing, swish your brush, dab it, pick up some of that pretty red violet, start that color where both the orange and the red end and paint on the rest. So you can see this goes fast. It doesn't take long to paint these, but it really packs a punch, the effect. And I'll show you something really quick. I've made a couple bigger versions of these. You can do some cool effects with them. Here's one where um, I use little pieces of, of saran wrap. So when I was done with each butterfly, while it was still wet, I just sort of bunched up saran wrap and placed it on top. And then I did not touch it until um, all the paint was dry. And then I just moved the, um, I gently peeled up the saran wrap and that can kind of create a cool effect. Conversely, uh, when all the paint is dry, you can also do some splatters with paint, do some paint splatters. So there's a couple of fun things you can do if you don't wanna just leave it the, the color like we're doing today. All right, so next number one, let's go ahead and paint this top one that is just the purple or the violet. And this one only gets the one color because it's just the bottom part of the butterfly. Mandy, good question from the chat. What if you get your paint going outside of the line? Is there a way to fix that? You could try taking a clean, slightly damp brush and running it on that section and then using a paper towel to lift. Um, that's probably going to be your best way to lift the paint. Um, but I would just chalk it up as a practice piece and maybe start over. <laughs> that's what I would say. But you can do some cleanup by taking just like literally you clean your brush, you dab it on a paper towel, and then you just wipe, 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 wipe. And then you can use a paper towel to lift those sections. That is something you can do. There's also an eraser that has sand in it. Um, and so that will lift some of the um, tooth of the paper. And that can also clean up. But you just have to be careful that it doesn't um, literally take off more tooth of the paper than you need, but that can be a way to also erase and lift some little mistakes. All right. A sand, I, think, I can't remember what it's called, like a sanded eraser or um, uh, I wish I could remember the name of it, but that could be something you could try to. I guess you could always make the butterfly a little bit bigger as well if you kind you of- You could do that. Yeah, you could but. do that. All right. So lower right butterfly, we're going to start with yellow because that's the lightest color on this one. So paint yellow on the right half. And then the left half will get yellow orange. So when you're done with the yellow, you'll just rinse your brush, dab it on a paper towel, pick up a bit of that yellow orange color and start by applying it right up next to that yellow so that the two colors can merge and blend into each other organically. I try not to mess with where they meet. I try to just let them do their own thing. That's easier said than done. I think it is human nature to wanna to fuss with it. <laughs> so try to resist that impulse. And then that's all the number one butterflies. So then this is where I'm gonna pull out my heat gun really fast. And I'm only gonna use it on two sections. I'm just gonna use it on this little bit of green that's overlapping this bottom butterfly. And I'm only gonna use it right here where it's overlapping this butterfly. I can let everything else dry on its own because I won't be applying any other color over it. This is just to dry these parts so that when I paint on butterflies that are numbered two, uh, it'll go wet over dry instead of wet over wet. 
Uh, you could use a hair dryer for this, but hair dryers tend to exude a bit more force of air and have a bigger um, section that sprays the heat or, you know, so I think it, it may be easier if you just use a heat gun, but if you don't have one, you can use a hair dryer, or you can just wait for butterfly butterflies that are numbered one to just dry. Okay. Hey Mandy, friendly reminder, we're 45 minutes into the class, just to let you know. Okay. Thanks. All okay. right. So this bottom left butterfly, we're going to start with the blue and I'm going to apply that on the upper right wing. And then I'm going to quickly swish my brush, dab it on a paper towel, and then I'll apply that pretty blue green to the uh, other side of that butterfly. And I'll also apply it over this butterfly that we applied first. And where they overlap, it is a darker color over a lighter color. It's blue green over green. And then the other number two is this one here, and it's going to be yellow orange on the entire left half. You guys will be amazed at how quick the tulips are. They are super fast. All right. And then orange to the lower right. And the orange will go over the yellow orange of that butterfly we drew last for the butterflies numbered one. And then swish our brush, dab it, and red orange will be applied to the upper right and to what's left. And then we'll just need to dry this wing here so that we can apply the last butterfly that is numbered one or number, numbered three. So I'll grab my heat gun again. And we're just going to dry that little section of the wing. And it just needs a second there. And then I'm going to apply red to the entire bottom half of this very last butterfly. And I can just go right over the red orange from that butterfly we just painted on because I dried it with the heat gun. It's amazing how it can save you time when you're painting using a heat gun. And then red violet will be applied to the upper half of this butterfly. The card is coming out very, very bright, Mandy. Very bright. Very bright. <laughs> very bright. <laughs> yes, these Cotman watercolors are very, very bright. Um, you you really can get really pigmented color from them. You know, as you're painting, just to tell everybody, you know, you're using the Cotman watercolor, the Sketcher box set. And if anybody goes back and replays any of your other classes, you've used that same sketcher box set on all your classes. So the, the colors are endless that you can do with just by purchasing that one set to do multiple, multiple projects. It's true. It is so true. And this is the mom card. It's done. So while you guys are finishing up that last butterfly, I'll show you really quick. Another class I have coming up May 25th are these anemones, red, white, and blue anemones. So they're going to be around Memorial Day, but they could be a good 4th of July project too. I have another red, white, and blue themed class coming up also in June, June 22nd. We're going to do a really fun red, white, and blue lollipop that uses a really fun wipe and lift technique. So I hope you'll join me for those classes and for that be kind wreath class that I showed earlier. All right. So for the tulips, last one, we're going to start with the lettering. So take your gold marker and just go over each letter one time. And to save time, since we're 10 minutes out, I'm not going to thicken up my downstrokes like I normally would, but you can thicken up all of your downstrokes on the card, just like you did on the uh, butterfly card, or you can use it. You can keep it with just one single layer of color. It's really up to you. You can even thicken up your downstrokes using a second color, using silver or something. So that's another thing you could do, but to save time, I just went over it one time. All right, and then the outline for the tulips is the same as the butterfly where I have the initial of the colors you're going to be using for each tulip and it's from left to right. So the top color is going to be the far left petal, the middle is going to be the middle petal, and then the bottom color listed is going to be the right petal. Okay, so how we're going to paint on the tulips is we're going to use three analogous colors. So colors that are right next to each other on the color wheel. That's what analogous means. And I'll just give you an example. So I might use blue as the center tulip. 
So let me draw a tulip here with a stem and a leaf. Okay. So I'm going to start top middle of my U shaped letter, and I'm going to draw a curved line down and I'm going to go back up to the top and I'm going to mirror that with another curved line down. And then I might just do a stroke up the middle, but leave a little bit of negative space for interest. Okay. And then the left petal, I'll do this turquoise here because it's to the left of blue. And I'm just going to draw one to two curved lines to the left, trying to get some negative space in there if I can. And then the other side of blue, well, we'll say it's violet today since we didn't do blue violet. And then I'll do another two, one to two curved lines on the other side of the center petal to make our tulip. So every tulip is going to receive three colors that are right next to each other on the color wheel. The stem and leaves, we're going to be using yellow, yellow, green, green, and blue, green. So all four of these colors, but we'll predominantly try and use these two colors. Okay. Um, so you can use them however you want. So as an example, I might start with some yellow, green and go halfway down the stem and then maybe do the bottom half with the regular green and then just let those colors bleed into each other as they want. I might do the bottom part of the leaf using yellow, maybe the top tip using that blue green. And then I might fill in the middle with the yellow green. So there's really no wrong way to do this. Um, you're just going to be using all four of these greens in varying spots, and then they're all kind of going to bleed into each other and kind of create a cool effect. All right. So this is how we're going to be painting on the tulips. And looking at my palette, I can tell I'm going to quickly need to mix just a little bit more orange. So I'm going to do that really fast here so I can make sure I don't run out of color as we do these tulips. And maybe just a touch more red, orange. So as you get good at this, you can, you can mix your colors so fast. <laughs> it doesn't take long. Um, you just kind of have to get in the practice of knowing exactly what you need to mix. All right. So I think I have enough color here now and we're ready to get started on these tulips. Okay. So we'll start with this lower left one. So red, orange is going to be the middle petal. So I'm going to put a little bit of the red, orange on my brush. And I'm going to start at the top middle of the U and I'm going to do a curved line down. I'm going to mirror that on the other side and maybe just do one or two lines through the middle for some negative space. I'm going to put red on the left. So I'm going to do a couple curved lines on the left. And then orange is on the right. And I'm going to do a couple curved lines on the right. Okay. And I'm not going to worry about the uh, stems and leaves yet. We'll do all the tulips first. So working up to this one, red violet is going to be the middle petal. So this is going to be one that you really aren't going to want to think too hard about. You're just going to want to do, and <laughs> you're just going to want to just do loose strokes. Violet is on the left. Maybe this one, I'll just do one curved line on the left and then red is on the right. Just like that. So they're just really loose tulips here. This top one, red is in the middle. Red violet is on the left. You see how fast this is? It um, is a really quick technique. And then red orange is on the right. And then we're just letting all of those colors bleed into each other where they meet. This bottom middle orange is going to be the middle tulip. I might make this one a little bit more open up top. And then red orange is going to be on the left. And yellow orange is going to be on the right. top right, yellow, orange is in the middle. Orange is on the left. And yellow is on the right. And then last for the tulips is this droopy bottom one. It's red, violet in the middle. 
I'm almost out of red violet here. So I'm going to try to work with what I have left. Violet will be on the left or what looks like the top. And then red will be on the right or what looks like the bottom. And then for the stems and the leaves, it's just going to be whatever combination you want of all your greens and your yellow, but you'll try and use mostly the green and the yellow green and the yellow and the blue green will just sort of be accents. So I might start with my yellow green and just paint on my first stem using the very tip of my number 10 brush. Now I like it when the greens bleed into the other colors, but if you don't like that, the green moving into the actual tulip petals, you can wait for the tulips to dry before you paint on the stems. Um, and then after I paint on the first time, I might grab some of the regular green and paint on the next one. And you'll see that where I go over the yellow green, those two colors will start to bleed into each other and mix into each other. Now I might use one of these fun accent colors, the yellow, and I might paint on another stem and maybe drop in just a little bit of the, uh, turquoise over part of that. And again, they're just all sort of bleeding into each other. They're analogous, meaning they're all right next to each other on the color wheel. None of them mixed together is going to create mud or a dark color. They're all gonna work really nicely together. I might take a bit more of that blue green and at least start the bottom of a stem and watch that bleed into those other greens and then grab my regular green and paint on the rest. Then I have a couple more stems here. I'll grab my yellow green again, and paint on one, and maybe my green to paint on the last. And then to paint on the leaves, I just like to use kind of a combination of colors. I might do the bottom with one color and then the tip with another, or I might do the bottom one color, the middle one color, and then the base one color. So maybe to this one down here, I'll start with yellow because I feel like I need more yellow in this pop of yellow. And then I'll use my green on the top. So again, you can't get this wrong. It's however you want to do it. And then one more leaf here, maybe some blue green along the top. And maybe the yellow green on the bottom and let those all kind of bleed and mix into each other. All right, so those are your tulips. I promised you it would go fast <laughs> and it sure did. <laughs> and no, I, I, that was like a fire hose as I was demoing it for you, but hopefully you got like a good feel for how I did it and um, just how quick and easy it is. It's something you're not gonna wanna think too hard about. You're just gonna paint on those petals and then uh, immediately paint on the other petals and let those colors bleed into each other. And um, before we end today, since we have a couple minutes, I would love to see all your work. And Maddie, I would love it if you could spotlight them so I can see too. Um, if you were able to paint along with me and keep up, if you would hold up one or both cards, whatever you're able to finish, I would just love to see. Oh, that's gorgeous. Great, what I, that looks awesome. Those are so pretty, yes. Thanks for showing these to me, guys. It looks so pretty. Nothing makes me happier as a teacher than seeing the finished work of my students. It really just brightens my day. If you can see my huge smile right now, well, I'll show you in a second <laughs> before we end today. Um, but great job, everyone. And uh, if you happen to be on social media, you can follow me. My handle is Mandy Peltier Artist at both Facebook and Instagram. You can just type in Mandy Peltier Artist and find me there. And you can go on my website, mandypeltier.com, and you can see my upcoming classes. You can find the links to register for them. You can see the classes I've taught previously if you wanna go back and rewatch those and download either the written instructions or the outlines. Um, and then of course, use the hashtag, make it with Michaels, Michaels classes, make art with Michaels, Windsor and Newton, so that we can all see the work uh, that you've done today. And um, I sure hope you had fun. Mandy, before you go, I have a question from the audience, and I oh, think sure. it's really good. Um, upon completion of these cards, what's the best way so you want to give them to somebody? So say if someone wants to put them in an envelope, 
How do you recommend them from not getting damaged? Would you put a piece of plastic around it or is it suffice if it just dries for a given amount of time, then you can place it inside of the card? Yeah, you could do that. Uh, just wait for it to dry and then it could go inside the card. Um, I do buy, I can open this up real quick. This is my finished tulip card. I mean, this is maybe something you wouldn't want to do, but you can buy these boards that sort of stabilize what you put your art on top. And then I have just a little clear sleeve that I stick it in and it keeps it stabilized. Another thing you can do if we have, I know it's three o'clock. I'll just try to explain this real quick. So if you were to cut your watercolor paper so that it would be five by or seven by 10 in size, seven by 10 in size like this, and you flip it to the back side and you take a butter knife, you can use the dull side of a butter knife to score the middle. And then when you paint, you can then fold it in half and you will literally have a greeting card. I hope that makes sense. So that's something you can do as well. And when I do that technique, I'll use a ruler to kind of stabilize the center and then I'll drag the dull end of the butter knife along the ruler so that I get a nice straight indentation that I can use to have a nice clean fold on the greeting card. So that's something else you can do and then just stick it in a five by seven envelope. But I hope that answers that question. and. Um, and just for other people in the audience, they're asking about the pencil. Mandy pressed down a little bit harder on the pencil so everyone can see it. But typically, if, if she was doing this and not on camera, she'd be going over it much lighter with the sketching. So you're not seeing it as, as much as you're seeing it there. But I think if you have the too much pencil on there, you can go back in once it's dry and go ahead and erase it slightly. You can, but I really recommend if you can find at the very least a 4-H pencil, or a 5H pencil, some kind of H pencil that's going to be a firmer graphite lead. So it's not going to bleed or smear as much. And it's also going to be a lighter color. The higher the number, the lighter the color. So 9H is like really light and really firm. So I think 4H to 6H works great. And then you'll likely not even see your pencil markings underneath the, the paint. So I really recommend that. And then you don't have to worry about erasing or you only have to erase what's on the outside of the watercolor paint. Sounds good. Right. Great class once again, Mandy. Hope everyone enjoyed that and everybody's making the cards for their moms for Mother's Day. Hey. And, uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. I had a great time today. Thank you. Bye everyone. I hope to see you next time. Join us again at Mandy's next class. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.